Hey, this is Peter from Waves and Games, and you're watching Chris Pico, the old ass retro gamer. Hey everybody, Chris the old ass retro gamer here. A little while back, I was watching a video on Captain Algebra's channel where he was talking about his top 10 NES games of all time. And I thought, you know what? Maybe this is a good topic for a video. So I asked him, I was like, are you okay with me doing a top 10 NES games video as well? And he said, do it, dude, I wanna see it. So all my selections are personal to me. They're all because of my experiences playing them back when I was a kid in the late 80s and early 90s. So obviously my choices are gonna be specific to me. Do not get mad when you do not see something that you think is absolutely fantastic on my list or all pissy when you see something that you absolutely hate on my list. Like I said, this is all about my personal experiences with these games and how they affected me. Now that that's out of the way, the NES is obviously one of my favorite consoles ever. I've mentioned it before on the channel, I was really late to the party on the NES. My parents didn't buy us one until I want to say 1989. No matter how much my brother and I cried and begged for our parents to get one, they're just like, hey, you've got an Atari 2600, be happy you have that. What can you do? But when we finally got our NES, I was able to amass a really decent library relatively quickly because I started saving my lunch money up. Instead of spending it on lunch at school, I would save it and then at the end of every week I was going out with like a group of friends to the mall and I'd always end up buying a clearance game that they had at a KB Toys in that mall. And if I didn't like one, I would trade it with a friend, get a new game from them. I remember I did that all the time with my friend Gary. He'd beat a game, wouldn't have any interest in playing it anymore. I'd take it off his hands by giving up something that he didn't have that I didn't want to play anymore. There was always a steady stream coming in. And obviously I played some good ones and I played some bad ones. Rented a whole lot of games back in the day as well. And when it comes to collecting, it's one of my favorite consoles to buy games for because nostalgia, and because, yeah, there was also a lot of games that I always wanted to play back in the day but didn't have the money to get. So as an adult, I'm like, you know what? Now I can buy those games. Let's do it. So I've amassed a pretty decent collection of boxed NES games. As you've seen, if you've watched my video game collection live streams, I did a two-parter on my NES collection. So you know I have a lot of stuff. And out of what I own, I picked my 10 favorites. So here we go. You have no idea the amount of hours and money I sank into playing Gauntlet at the arcades, including like whenever I would go to Great America, which is like the Six Flags amusement park that's in Illinois, I would go to the arcades in there where my parents would be doing whatever and I would find a cabinet of this and just play. I didn't care which character I was playing as, each single one of them was fun because you have the choice of four different characters. You have a fighter, a Valkyrie, an elf, archer, and a wizard. Each of them plays differently. You pick one of the four characters and then you go through these dungeons taking out ghosts, goblins, or Orcs, demons, and all that trying to not only replenish your health because you're obviously moving and fighting, you're expending energy, so your health is always dropping at a slow rate. You need to constantly be refilling it, find bombs that'll clear the screen. There's generators that are creating the monsters that you're fighting. You need to take those out so you don't get completely swarmed and also find keys to unlock doors and eventually find the exit to the stage. Some exits will actually jump you ahead a few more stages instead of just taking you to the next one. The one thing that I will always remember about this is it's one of the first dungeon crawl action games available. There wasn't even a term for it back then. But when you go back and play it, it's remarkable how much this reminds you of Baldur's Gate or Champions of Norath. The thing I liked the most about the arcade cabinet of Gauntlet was that you could play four people at the exact same time. Not so on the NES, at least not this one. The original game only has a two player mode, but if you have Gauntlet 2 and you have a four score, you can actually play four people at the same time. It's really chaotic, but it works. But even though you can't do four players on this one, this one to me is still the better game. It was a game released by Atari originally, which was Tengen, and their port is pretty fantastic. Yeah, it doesn't look and sound exactly like the arcade, but it's close enough to the point where I don't mind. The reason I end up buying a lot of those classic arcade compilations is because it does have arcade perfect ports of Gauntlet on it. But you know what? For a downgraded port of an awesome arcade game, this one does it for me every time. It's awesome. <laughs> This is a very cool Diamond in the Rough style game for the NES that I've always enjoyed. It might be just unique to me because my best friend Charlie back in the day was a skateboarder. He had a skateboard ramp in his basement. I used to make little home movies with him all the time that was about skateboarding. I didn't skateboard myself, but I became interested in the culture of it and you know everything about it 
through him. First time I ever played this was at his house. I watched him play it and I was like, wow, I've played the original Skater Die. It's kind of shitty. So when he said that I needed to see it, I was kind of skeptical. I was like, oh great, there's gonna be more stupid mini games that control like ass. Uh, no, it turns out this is a skateboarding platformer. It's an action adventure game with skateboarding as the main mechanic. And yes, there's also some ramp stuff in here as well, just in case you want to play that instead. It has a really funny plot where skateboarding has been banned because the main character you play as accidentally ran over the mayor's wife's dog. So wherever you go, you got like people on your ass. You have a paintball gun as your main weapon. There's money that you have to find in the form of cassette tapes, CDs, chili fries and tacos you can buy upgrades and the graphics are really good yeah the controls take a little bit of getting used to because you're not running you're skateboarding so you have this whole momentum thing going on that you got to worry about but once you get used to it it is like second nature this game has absolutely phenomenal music i think this had one of those special sound chips in it because the music sounds like real music at times there's like sample drum loops and stuff and yeah it sounds chip tuney it sounds a lot better than most of the stuff that was out there around the same time but it's totally unique super fun and again that not a lot of people talk about it's a unique take on a platformer and i've always appreciated it for that like i said diamond in the rough right here you knew there was going to be some movie licensed games on this list i mean look who you're talking to it is inevitable this was probably one of the first games I got for the NES back in the day. We got the NES Christmas of 89 and we got this game almost at the exact same time. And yes, I knew that a lot of the licensed games that came out earlier for the NES were pretty piss poor quality. Everyone I knew unanimously agreed is absolutely fantastic and a must have for the console. It's a side scrolling platformer slash beat em up where you play as Batman loosely follows the plot of the movie because there's a lot of characters that show up in this that have nothing to do with that film which kind of makes me think that this was not a batman game and then once sunsoft purchased the license to the batman movie they slapped him into it and the joker and basically that was it but it doesn't bother me because it has cut scenes that tied into the movie you go through a lot of the areas that are in the movie obviously they look completely different but whatever but it's all about the gameplay with this one the graphics are very cool even though batman is purple and blue the level designs are great and well thought out the controls are spot on if the wall jumping mechanic that's in here didn't work perfectly everybody would have been like no f this game because that's a mechanic that you use almost in every single stage but the thing i think everybody remembers this game for is the absolutely fantastic score. It has some of the catchiest, most memorable tunes in an NES game ever. You got perfect controls, outstanding graphics for the time, amazeballs music, and it's based on the awesome Batman movie from 1989. Yeah, I think you got a winner here. And you know what? Like I said, this is the one that surprised everybody. All of a sudden, licensed games were in. The amount of time I spent playing this back in the day, well spent. Yeah, this is a game about pinball, digital pinball. This is probably my favorite digital pinball game of all time. You can throw me anything available on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, what have you. I'm guaranteeing you that I'm always gonna compare it to this. This is the gold standard for me. This was developed by Rare, which is probably my favorite video game developer of all time. So that's a big plus. And also it's just a simple, well-made pinball game based on a real pinball machine that I've played plenty of times in real life. A lot of the pinball games out there either scrolled up and down as the ball would travel up and down the table, or the game would be so zoomed out that the ball would be super tiny just so you could see everything going on. The way that Rare handled it here is you're always going to see the flippers on screen. The screen gets cut off and the top part of the screen scrolls to follow where the ball goes. It works very, very well. The graphics are super colorful and it plays great. If the controls in this sucked, it would have been a complete bust, but no, it's perfection and plus all of the ramps secrets everything that was from the original pinball game is in here recreated perfectly with a very catchy rendition of the music that would always be playing in the game itself and for as simplistic a game as this is this was probably one of the games i played the most on my nes back in the day i just couldn't get enough of it simple and fun to the point no frills amazing why we never got bride of pinbot on the nes i will never know but you know what I still want it. I didn't have this game right off the bat when I got my NES because I had watched a friend of mine play through the entire game in front of me in one sitting back when it was first released. So 
I was kind of like, I've already seen the game get beaten, so I was not in a rush to get a copy of my own. But eventually I did, and I played the crap out of it once I got it, and I really, really enjoyed it. I wasn't really into RPGs back then, but this was kind of like a combination of like a light RPG and an adventure game, and it was hard in all the right ways. There's lots of secrets to discover. I never had a walkthrough, so when I would get stuck, I'd call my friend and he'd kind of give me like a cryptic hint as to some place where I needed to look and uh, to put a bomb on a specific place to open up a path that I had missed or something like that. Lots of exploration, lots of cool upgrades to your character, finding all the heart containers, getting all the different weapons and gadgets like the compass and everything. It was just a really unique game experience because at that point in time, the only like adventure games like this that I'd ever played was like Sword Quest on the Atari 2600. So this is a huge step up from that type of game. And yeah, while there really wasn't any kind of a deep story going on, it's basically, I need to kill this guy, and there's all this stuff in your way. It's a fantastically fun game, as well as being supremely entertaining. And you know what, the funny thing is, as much as I love this game, I still haven't beaten the second quest. This is some bull Bro, I need to get on that. And as the game that introduced Link and the land of Hyrule to the world, you gotta give props. Star Tropics is a game that I watched my friend, that I watched beat The Legend of Zelda, beat as well. And even though I watched him beat the game in one sitting again, I really wanted a copy of it because this game just completely impressed me in every single way. While it was trying to be sort of like The Legend of Zelda, it was doing its own thing at the same time because yes, there were like dungeons that you would go into, but it would completely switch up the gameplay because there was an overworld where you would be talking to characters, but once you would go into like a dungeon, the action would zoom in and all of a sudden there's this hopping mechanic because there's all these blocks that you need to jump on that will unlock doors, activate enemies, maybe stop an enemy from attacking, and it was different enough to make me really take notice. Yeah, there was some cryptic stuff in here, like there was one part you couldn't pass unless you had a specific message that you could only get by this letter that was included with the game. Because you have to at least get the bottom part of this letter underneath this shamrock wet to uncover a hidden message that lets you progress into the game. It was stuff like that that was alternately frustrating and kind of enthralling at the same time because it was trying to do different types of things to keep you invested in the game and the characters, and that went a long way with me. But the storyline about the protagonist Mike searching for his missing uncle on this weird island situation is so charming and likable and fun. Even though I'd already seen the game played through to completion, I wanted to do it myself. Great controls, catchy ass music, challenging boss battles, some of the hopping mechanics, yeah, they can be frustrating every once in a while but you know what it's all in the name of fun and this game really did it for me back in the day and it still does it for me now Come on, license game, duh. I talk about this game on my channel a lot because number one, developed by Rare. Number two, based on one of my favorite film franchises of all time. And three, it's a fantastically fun game that uses the lore of the films in great, unique ways. So it's a side-scrolling platformer. You play as one of the Elm Street kids. You have to go into all these different buildings and find all of Freddy's bones, throw them in the furnace, and take out Freddy once and for all. But the cool thing is this borrows elements from A Nightmare on Elm Street 3 where it has to do with all the Dream Warriors powers. So there's this whole way waking and dreaming aspect of the game where for the most part you're playing in the waking world but you have like this sleep meter that's always going down and once it gets down to nothing you will go into the dream world where the enemies are a little bit harder to kill as you're playing through the waking world you will find these icons that in the dream world will translate into dream powers you can become an acrobat which means you can jump really really far and you have these javelins that you can throw as weapons but they have a real short range you can become a wizard when he jumps can float for long distances kind of like peach in super mario brothers 2 and you have these fire Balls. And then you can also become a ninja who has a jump kick, which is probably the most powerful move in the game. And you also have shurikens, but they travel a very short distance and are not very powerful. You'll encounter all these different versions of Freddy that you fight as bosses throughout the various locations. Some are taken from the films, some are not. One of the really cool aspects about this game is that if you have the four score, you can actually play this with four players at the exact same time. I cannot imagine how well that would work. It's really hard sometimes to keep track of where your character is because sometimes there's too much stuff going on on screen. So with four players, I cannot imagine that being very fun, but as a single player, even as a two player game, it's pretty awesome. The graphics are really nice. The play control is actually really good once you get the hang of it. But once again, the music is absolutely fantastic. This is by David Wise, who was like the in-house composer 
composer over at Rare, and he came up with some really awesome, catchy, moody music for this game. But my favorite part is, it feels like it belongs in the Nightmare on Elm Street universe. And don't believe the hype. Not all LJN games are garbage, because this one is a winner as far as I'm concerned. Always has been since the moment I first played it. Yet another license game, and another one by Sunsoft no less. Like I said, Sunsoft knew what the hell was going on when it came to license games back then. Gremlins 2 was one of my favorite films in the early 90s, I absolutely adored it, and this was one of the first games we got for our NES back in the day, and it is basically the best license game on the NES as far as I'm concerned. Not only does it feel like Gremlins, but it's just a fun game in general, like one of the most fun games out there. It's in like a top-down three-quarter view, you play as Gizmo, and you're in the clamp building, and you have to make your way to the top in order to defeat all the gremlins that have taken over. You start off with a really simple weapon, which is throwing tomatoes. I know you didn't do any of that kind of stuff in the movie, but whatever, you have to start off with something, right? <laughs> As each level progresses, you will get better weapons, like a match and like a bow and arrow paperclip thing. And there's obviously bosses that are the different gremlins that you encountered in the movie. There's shops you can go into to purchase upgrades and health and all that kind of stuff. And you would think that in like a top-down view, platforming would be kind of a pain in the ass. It's not, it's pulled off perfectly well here. It's fantastic and easy and fun to pick up and play. With each level that you go through, the difficulty ramps up, but it's fair, which is something you can't say about a lot of games on the NES. The graphics are super charming, and everything is instantly recognizable as something from the film. Level design is great, and each level introduces a new element that you need to overcome. And once again, the music is excellent, and it holds up remarkably well. People are still being introduced to this game nowadays. Like I said, back in the day, licensed games, nobody really gave any attention to any of them except Batman and LGN games for the wrong reason. This is one of those games that I was instantly impressed with the moment we brought it home, and I went out and told every single one of my friends, hey, you wanna play a great game? Go and buy that Gremlins 2 and every time they'd be like, eh, it's a movie-based game. Those are crap. No, give it a chance, you will not be disappointed. It is still held up extremely well. Controls, graphics, music, gameplay, everything about it is top-notch. Some people love Ninja Gaiden. I like Ninja Gaiden just fine. I just like Shadow of the Ninja even more, because you know what? This game is not ridiculously hard. It's a side-scrolling action game, kind of like Ninja Gaiden, but less chaotic. You have two different characters to choose from. You have a male and a female ninja. Each of them plays the same, but they just look a little bit different. You get all these different weapons. You start off with a regular sword, but the one weapon that makes this game pretty awesome to play is you get this, like, hook on a chain that has like our super long range because the range of your starting weapon, the sword, is not all that long. Once you get that hook on a chain, it changes the way the game plays from that point on because now you can keep the enemies at a distance and not have to accidentally take a hit because you timed your sword strike wrong. The levels are varied. The control is super tight and spot on. The graphics are not as good as Ninja Gaiden's but awesome nonetheless. And the music is super catchy. It featured a lot of new mechanics which Ninja Gaiden did not have. And as far as I was concerned, it had improved on the formula established by Ninja Gaiden without copying it. I do own the first two Ninja Gaiden games for the NES, but you know what? This is the one that I keep coming back to because I can actually beat this one. I don't think I'd ever played a game by Natsume before this game came out, and I bought it when it first was released, and I instantly fell in love with it. I was like, okay, Ninja Gaiden was great while it was relevant. This is the new Ninja Gaiden for me. And also having two players simultaneous, Absolutely fantastic, and probably the most preferred way to play this as far as I'm concerned. So before I hit number one, why don't I show off some honorable mentions? Yes, this is the Super Mario Bros. 2 that is not a real Super Mario Bros. game. It is a hack of a game called Doki Doki Panic that came out for the Famicom Disk System in Japan. 
the original Super Mario Bros. 2 was actually just like the original Super Mario Bros., but was just deemed way too hard for us Americans. So, when it came time to release a second Mario Brothers game because money printing machine, they decided to hack a game, bring it out over here. We didn't know any better, but everybody knew there was something weird about it because it just didn't feel like the original Mario Brothers game. Didn't really follow a lot of the rules set up by that game either, did it? Back on the NES, whenever you had a major franchise, it was kind of a thing where the follow-up would be a completely different style of game. You had Castlevania, which was a side-scrolling beat-em-up platformer, and then you had Castlevania 2, which is a pseudo-action-adventure RPG. You had The Legend of Zelda. The first one is a top-down action-adventure game. The second one is a side-scrolling RPG light. And then you had Mario Brothers. This was completely different from what the original was. There was no stomping on enemies. There were no blocks that you needed to jump up and hit with your fist to get power-ups. This one is all about when you jump on an enemy's head, you can ride them. And then you end up having to pick them up and you can throw them at each other. There's vegetables and fruits in the ground that you can uproot and use them as weapons by throwing them at enemies. There's like these negative zones that you can go into if you uncover a potion. I didn't care. Yes, I loved the original Super Mario Brothers. It's a seminal game in history. I mean, it basically changed the way games were played. But you know what? This game did it better as far as I was concerned. Because there's different characters to play as, each of them has their own strengths and weaknesses that offered a level of strategy that the original Mario Brothers didn't have because you have to pick the right character for the level you're on if you want to play through it correctly. Mario is the all-around character. He's good at jumping, he's good at running, he's got a good pull speed because you have to pull things out of the ground constantly. Luigi is a slow puller, but he runs fast and he has a very long jump. You got Princess Peach who pulls extremely slow, but she floats when she jumps, so she can travel across great distances. And then you have Toad, who is my personal favorite character, who pulls things extremely fast but has a shitty jump. All these different play styles in each level. There's ice levels that are super slippery. There's levels where you have to like ride characters that fly in order to get to different sections of the level. All the different bosses require a different strategy instead of just the same thing like with Bowser in the original game. And then you finally come across Wart, who is one of the hardest bosses in the game, but once you know what you're doing, it's not a big deal. This was a completely new experience compared to the first game and that went a long way with me. I was glad that Nintendo was not releasing games that were just the same thing over and over and over again. They were giving us new experiences with established characters. This game was the one that I played all the time. I'd still be getting new games always be coming back to play this some more. And I beat it more times than I can count. This is probably the most played game I had in my NES library back then. And for good reason. It's fantastic. And you know what? I do own Doki Doki Panic for the Famicom Disk System. And you know what? This version is actually the best version between the two. By changing it into a Mario game, they improved on it completely. Shocking, but it's true. So yes, this is my favorite NES game of all time. There you have it, my top 10 NES games of all time. What are your top 10 NES games? What are some of your favorites? Let me know in the comments below. I really want to know. Do a response video like I kind of just did. Captain Algebra was the first person I saw make the list. I decided to do one of my own because of it. So if I've inspired you to do the same thing, let me know about it in the comments. Let Captain Algebra know. Tag all of us. Let us all know. Because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be the last person to do this topic either. And I'm definitely not the first. So yeah, share your picks. Let me know. I look forward to hearing from you. And until next time, I am Chris the Old Ass Retro Gamer signing off.